It is Thursday, June 26, 2014. I'm Marie Denoya Aronson here at the Eagleton Institute at Rutgers University, continuing the examination of the administration of former New Jersey Governor Christy Todd Whitman. With me today is Eileen McGinnis, who served as Chief of Policy and Planning for the Whitman administration. Welcome, Eileen. Let's start with a little bit about you. Tell us about where you grew up and your family. Sure. Glad to be here. Um, I grew up in Hudson County, New Jersey, with bastion of uh, democratic politics. So it was a sort of winding road to the uh, Whitman uh, administration. And I was born in 1955, and I mention that because I think the year people born are sort of, it sort of forms a lot of how they think and what they want out of life. And I was born in an Irish Catholic household. So I grew up in a household where there was a photograph of John F. Kennedy and the Pope over the TV, black and white TV. Uh, and that really formed my life in lots of different ways because I always wanted to be a public servant. I sort of uh, bought into the whole thing, do what you, ask what you can do for your country, not what your country for, can do for you. And that was really my lifelong dream to be in public service. So I um, count myself as very fortunate that I did realize my, my career dream. Tell us a little bit about your family. How many brothers and sisters, sure. and were they all also interested in, in public service? Uh, not as much as I. I think really, even in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I knew exactly what I, what I wanted to do. And sometimes I think, you know, about. Uh, you know, being a middle child too, so I was always interested in issues of fairness. <laughs> like what? <laughs> so I think that also was thing. Like I was always interested in issues of haves and have-nots, and how government can play a role in that and making things more fair. Uh, so I think that even played into it. I'm the second of four. My sister just retired yesterday, actually, after a 35-year career as a teacher in Bayonne, New Jersey. She stayed there, and I have two brothers uh, who are in also followed, now in Mercer County. And my parents now live in Ocean County, so hmm. everybody stayed in New Jersey. So your interest was public service, mm -hmm. and you became very involved in politics, yes. which is, mm -hmm. uh, t tell us about how that happened, how you no, first started. I was more started. interested in policy than politics, but mm -hmm. to execute, implement policy, you often do it in a political arena. Uh, and as you said, I was the chief of policy, and, uh, you know, being uh, chief of policy, I think, is the best job in government because... Uh, chief of staff. I know you've. I know you've. You've talked to chief of staffs and uh, uh, chief of count, chief councils. It's a different type of job. Uh, chief of policy. Really, people refer to it as sort of the conscience of the office. It's not sort of it. Uh, it's a little above the politics of it. Uh, and the way Christy Whitman ran the office, she really looked to the office as to bring. Um, the best and brightest ideas in the country to New Jersey, what was going on nationally. And that's really not what other offices do. Uh, so we were fortunate enough to, one of the things that she was proud of was the uh, drug court, which Bruce Stout um, was responsible for. And that was an idea that was percolating across the country. The cultural trust, which Carol Cronheim brought from some part of the country. So there were lots of different things that were going on that you know, we really brought to New Jersey based on what was good policy across the country. And I think, you know, Christy Whitman would say that too, the part of the job that she liked the most was the policy making, not so much the politics of it, was really what was it, what always interested her was good policy, and that, that was my interest too. When did you first meet her? Uh, I met her actually after she was elected governor through Jane Kenney, who was my boss when I got to the uh, governor's office. And she was actually, Jane was also my boss when I worked for Governor Kane. So uh, as, as you know, people cycle through administrations. They leave at the end of four or eight years and then work somewhere else and then come back when their party comes back into power. And I actually saw that when I left uh, the state and worked at EPA, the exact same thing. People would cycle in and out and uh, people would wait for their party to come back in and, and then uh, rejoin uh, policy or political jobs political jobs. What was uh, your work with the Kane administration? Just I worked in the Office of Constituent Relations and Jane was the head of that, which, you know, again, uh, I'm, I hope some students watch this, these things uh, because that, I would uh, recommend that to anybody as a way to start out their career. Uh, you learn ins and outs of government, what different departments do. You know, you learn Social Security is not a state issue, it's a federal issue. A lot of people don't understand sort of what a state issue is as opposed to a federal issue or a municipal issue. Uh, and so I got a firm grounding in all levels of government uh, there. And uh, also I learned how to write very quickly uh, and well. And under Jane's, as, as you know, Jane was a, 
a student of literature and English. So I think all of us uh, learned a whole lot under her. And uh, so that stands me well now, I think, because I, I enjoy writing very much. Going back to the time when you first met Christy mm -hmm. Todd Whitman, can you remember where you were a little bit? Like, give us sort of the scenario that. Well, I, I was brought on as a deputy chief of policy. And one of the things about Governor Whitman was that she gave a lot of her staff a, a lot of responsibility very early on. So we were able to bring ideas to her very quickly. And I was, uh, you know, in a lot of meetings with her. You know, the, the, the rhythm of. Uh, State government is is fascinating, really, and I think when I taught at Eagleton, I would always always talk about this to the students because there's two real big speeches of the year: so the state of the state of the state in January, followed by the budget message in March, and the, you would start preparing for the State of the Union in September. So you would work with the cabinet members September, October, November, December, try to bubble up some really good ideas that fit in with her the governor's agenda announced that speech, and it was a tremendous amount of work, of course. We'd go to her house in Pontefract and to practice, and that was always fun, uh, the weekend before. Uh, the big speech was that day, and then immediately, you know, we start working on the budget speech, and then the budget, New Jersey's proud to say, we, we passed balanced budgets by uh, the constitutional deadline. Uh, and then the policy office would be responsible to pair with the legislative office in getting all those legislative initiatives done uh, over the summer and in the fall, and then you start again in the fall. So it was a nice rhythm of it that you sort of, the year would pass very quickly and lucky enough to work in an era where it was possible to get a lot of things done. So it was, you know, it was a very active government, which Jersey often is, unlike the, when I worked in the federal government where, you know, you, I think the whole time I was in the federal government there was one bill passed, in, in uh, environmental bill, and that was the Brownfields bill that had been 10 years in the making. So a lot of the legisla legislative effort on the federal level is to stop things from happening instead of making things happen. Uh, so there's lots of, I often talk to students about this, or the different uh, different experiences when you work for a state or, or a federal government is very different. So I keep bringing you back to this okay, one moment. I'm not, no, no, I'm just, this is very helpful. Um, but I'm just wondering if you happen to recall the moment when you first met uh, then Governor Whitman. I, th I th the thing, the memory that stands out was I was responsible for um, welfare reform at the time. And uh, the governor had asked uh, for a round table, again, what ideas were around the country. And I, and I believe I introduced her uh, at that round table. And uh, that's, that's my clearest memory of her. And I don't, oh, and I think, you know, actually I was, I, I might have been pregnant with my first child at the time. And uh, right around then, uh, she was ask, um, asking me how I was feeling and just taking more of a personal interest. Yeah. What were your first impressions of her? Um, and I think all of us in the beginning were somewhat in awe of her, uh, truthfully, candidly. Uh, um, the, you know, if I had to describe one word, we use one word to describe her, it would be uh, civil. She's a very civil person, and I think those of us who worked for her many years, I learned that from her. And, um, you know, my, I work now in, a, 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 in the private sector, but I start meetings on time. You know, I treat people very respectfully. A lot of things that the way I comport myself in my work life now, I do because I watched her. Uh, and things like not, not blaming people if things go wrong, taking responsibility if things go wrong, um, wanting to learn from experiences. So a lot of things that just the, sort of the soft skills of working in, in her organization, I really did learn from her. Now, during her second term, you became chief of policy mm -hmm. and planning, correct? Um, that's you replaced Jane Kenney. Yes. Um, what were your responsibilities at that point, and what did you think about having that position? That really is, has is the best <laughs> position in state government. Uh, you're working with all the uh, cabinet uh, and trying to create an agenda to, to move things forward in New Jersey to really serve the people of New Jersey in the best way, in the best way of public service. Uh, what is best for the citizens of the state. Um, it's, a, it's a great job because I got to work with uh, a lot of talented people. Uh, and not every day, but most days you get up and you're able to move the ball a bit uh, and do good things. And 
you know, she had a very traditional, in some ways, a Republican agenda, focusing on taxes and lowering income tax, and property tax is always a perennial issue in, issue in New Jersey, um, you know, uh, decreasing the sales tax. So certainly sale, uh, taxes were a big issue for her, but they, they were an issue for her because she does, she did and does believe they're an engine to job creation. I think yeah. that's what she's most proud of in the state. Uh, is jo the, jo the number of jobs that were created during her tenure. So it wasn't tax reduction for it ended of itself as really how it fuels the economy. Uh, but she did a lot of non, you know, what's non-traditional Republican initiatives that probably things I were more, most more interested in. Um, preservation of a million acres, which, yes. you know, she tells a story about, you know, she lives in Somerset County, Hunterton, is that Pontefract? I'm not sure where it is in Somerset. But it's her driving, that, doing that drive every day to Trenton, she saw sort of farms carved up. So that's really yeah. how she got interested in that. And that's what she asked me to focus on. Uh, she asked me to focus on the implementation of the Abbott decision, you know, a lot. I'll, you know, so yes. I was working with Leo Clackholtz on that and then Dave Hesby. Um, I worked on the energy dereg bill with, you know, so there's a lot of, but, you know, it's really uh, what I focused on mostly was making sure the things that she announced in January were implemented and carried through because one of the things that she wanted to do is keep, keep her promises, as she said. So I think she looked to me and to Mike Torpy and John Farmer or people like, this is what I said I would do because she's a person of her word. Uh, I'm looking to you to carry out what I said I would do. So yeah. that was the responsibility of the job, really. That's really a theme we hear quite a bit when mm -hmm. we do these interviews. There was actually a list, correct? Yes, and I was keep. the keeper of that list. You were the keeper yes. of the list. Yes. All right. Now, just backtracking a bit, your um, family, you mentioned JFK mm -hmm. and yeah. Democrat. Mm -hmm. How did you end up in the world you know, of Republican, New Jersey because, Republican? You know, I think some people relate to this, especially women. Uh, in a lot of Democratic strongholds, you have to wait your turn. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who want to get there. And women aren't always at the top of that list. And really what I wanted to do more than uh, anything was to be part of governance. That's what I was interested in. And the Republicans took me in before the Democrats as really what it was. You know, I tried uh, to grow. I, only, I didn't really know any uh, Republicans until I was like 19 or 20. It was just <laughs> like that wasn't the world I grew up in. Right. Um, but I you know, tried to knock on those doors and no one opened the door. And uh, you know the Republicans opened the door. I actually I interviewed with Gary Stein, who was uh, the chief of policy for Governor Kane, and he was the one who first hired me. And he knew I, at the time I was a Democrat. So it was interesting that the Republican administration was willing to open the door uh, for me. And it, that's not always the case. What do you think it was about you that led them to to bring you in? Uh, you know I think he what he told me why he hired me is that he thought I was a very curious person, which I think I am. Uh, and I think he just, you know, in the policy office, you sort of have to be a jack of all trades because you're responsible for a, a wide portfolio. So I think that's, that's what happened. And, and I, I, Gary's a terrific guy. I keep in touch with him now. That's great. Mm -hmm. So when you were um, moving the ball forward, as you mm -hmm. put it, were you working with the, through the legislature as well? Usually I would work with someone in council's office. We would pair up in teams. Um, either Mike Torpy or John Farmer or somebody who was responsible for a specific legislative initiative. And we, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if you saw a couple weeks ago when Jay Carney left the White House yes. and uh, the chief of staff came out and gave him a big hug. And I saw that on TV for a f uh, just a quick second. And I was reminded about, reminded of the bonds that you really do develop during that time for good and bad reasons. You know, one of the bad reasons is that you do feel you're under siege a lot. So I think that sort of brings people together. Uh, but also you bond because you're in the trenches and you're trying to move the ball forward. Uh, so you're in the same battle together. So I think there's a, even though I don't see a, a lot of the people besides Jane uh, a lot, when I do see them, you know, it's like I was with them yesterday. and. I'm very, very fond of all the people I served with. Yeah, it's a high intensity work very culture, high intensity right? And, and you share a lot of values too, though. So, uh, and you're proud of your accomplishments. And I think people who worked for Christy Whitman, um, and you probably heard this in other administrations, on much. I, I, I'll speak for her administration. Are very, very fond of her, uh, yeah. in part because she treated us so well, gave us a lot of responsibility, gave us the opportunity to tried to improve the world in, a, in, a small, in our own little yes. world. Um, and, you know, just was very respectful. You know, and again, I was reminded of this a few months ago during the whole 
um, GW bridge thing where you know, our current governor, I believe, called one of the aides stupid. Um, you would, uh, she would cut her right arm off before she made that kind of statement of anyone. Never, never. You know, it just wouldn't happen. Um, now, that's not to say over the years she wasn't disappointed in people or decisions, but she would handle it privately, uh, respectfully. It's, you know, I think uh, even after all these years, people do appreciate that's the kind of person she was. It is. Because it creates trust. Exactly. That's a good word to put it. As head of policy and planning, you had a big role in really shaping her legacy. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to, about that a little bit? Some of the policies I know you you mentioned on um, the open space uh, yeah. was Millionaire such a signature mm -hmm. policy for her. Well, I certainly think the charter schools, uh, and which you know, now is sort of fabric of our life in New Jersey that we don't hear about it as much. But uh, you know, many many Democrats have said to me, who's who sent their children there that could not have happened in a democratic administration because the, un you know, the, because the unions would, be, sure. would have been all over it. Um, so that was brave of her to do, and I think the state's better off for that. Uh, certainly uh, it remains controversial, but I think people have accepted it for the, for the most part. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, her, her I, I really believe the emphasis on job creation is part of her legacy, too. I think she's the most proud of that. But there's little things, too, that I'm reminded of. Um, you know, she was uh, part of an effort to close some of the big institutions we have for the disabled. Yeah. That was not an easy task for her because, again, a lot of unions were involved. Um, you know, parents were justifiably afraid of what was going to happen to their adult children. Uh, but she thought it was the right thing to do. So when you know, I read about what's happening in institutions, and that really, again, was um, brought to her attention, not only by letters that she read, but again, the policy office said to her, compared to other states, too many of our disabled population are spending time in huge institutions. We need to do a better job. And I think some other governors might have said, I'm not taking that on. Uh, but again, she thought it was the right thing to do. So I think that's, you know, part of her legacy in a small way, uh, but certainly being uh, the first woman governor. I mean, that, he, I don't know when it's going to happen again. I hope it, hap it happens again in my lifetime, but I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't happen again. Um, so that's certainly a big part. And, they, and also um, encouraging so many other women like myself, uh, Judy Shaw, you know, lots of women to, <coughs> Debbie Poritz, to assume uh, you know, powerful positions, and they in turn show that it can be done. Uh, now I am um, the president of an energy services company, and uh, it was founded by a woman. And um, so, and I just uh, my my CFO is a woman, my director of operations is a woman, my director of HR is a woman. Woman. Um, so you know, I do, and that I I said a few minutes ago how I learned a lot by watching her. Uh, during the time I was with her, and, and probably that's another effect. You know, I do like to promote women um, and to positions. Do you trace that back to the fact that you? I do. I, you know, do. there's lots of ways, ways that uh, you know you're, you're <coughs> with, and then I also went with her with TPA. So I was with her for quite a while. So you know, you, you do a lot of watching and how how people behave, and uh, she was a good role model for all of us. Do you think the fact that she was the first woman governor has had an impact beyond this circle, beyond you and your colleagues? No, I, I don't know if, if Jane told the story while she was here, but uh, her son Greg's, who's now 22, right, 23, <laughs> said to her, I didn't know a uh, man could be governor. Because uh, he, he, his formative <laughs> years, well, she was there. So I think it you know, affects people. And I have two daughters, and they grew up practically in the state house because I was they were in and out. and uh, so. Their formative years, that's what they knew. Uh, so I think people even, don't even know how it affected them over time. And it little, comes out in little ways. Yes. Did you feel you faced different expectations because she was the first woman, because you were a woman in this position of power? You know, the legislature, I think, continues to be sort of um, more male dominated. And I think New Jersey has better presence now, women, female you know, presence. Uh, so I think. That was always difficult. It's, uh, you know, the year after the governor left New Jersey, she was serving uh, in the cabinet. And um, she was having a, getting, I think, a lot of negative criticism here um, 
I can't even remember why, to tell you the truth, but I remember <laughs> calling up Governor Kane uh, and asking for some advice about sort of why was she getting so, getting so criticized. I think it was about fiscal issues, and um, I really don't recall. And um, so he, he had an interesting conversation with him. He said that his first year after he left, he thought everybody was criticizing him and nobody was coming to his defense because a lot of, of his former aides were in positions where they couldn't help him. Uh, so I said, well, why do you think it's so so harsh right now? And, and uh, he said he thought it was because she was a woman and that she hadn't come up through the legislature. So they felt there was a sort of a, you know, some people, I don't know, it's a um, uh, broad brush, but some people had more of a free reign to criticize her. Um, and then he said, you know, so he, he was trying to f help me figure out why it was the case then. So I think it does come into play, but she was never one to, uh, to ascribe things to, well, they're doing that because I'm a woman. I, actually, in the whole time I, I've known her, I've never really heard her say that. Hmm. What do you think were some of her greatest strengths? I think you've mentioned mm -hmm. a number of them already, mm -hmm. but in, in the context of looking at the administration as a whole. You know, I, I, I think, I don't know if, the, I hope this era isn't gone, but uh, I think people like her and Governor Kane, Roger Freeland, they, they, they wanted to serve the public for, for the truest, uh, best reason. Um, not for ego, not to self-gain. Uh, so I think she really came out of that era, you know, in part because of her mother and father, uh, but really came into public service to better, the, to, to improve things. So I think that was a strength. Um, she's smart, she's curious, she's, you know, well-read. Um, you know, and by nature she's, she's, uh, I wouldn't say, she, you know, she has right now, because people, I run into people and they say, how, how is she doing? Um, you know, she has what most of us want in life. I mean, she has a, a very happy marriage. She married the same person for 40 years or something. Two children who are doing well. Uh, a handful of grandchildren now. Uh, Kate um, built, and her husband built a house right across from the government, so she got to see her grandchildren grand, uh, every day. She's active in her church. Uh, She's very healthy, she bikes, um, and she's on a, several boards and involved in several nonprofits, teaches occasionally. So, I th you know, by temperament, uh, she's not a person who looks back and has regrets. Um, you know, she's, she's happy, she's very content. It sounds like her um, priorities, the service, prior yeah, align very that. much with your own. I, 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 think she, I think people gravitated toward her with uh, those values. What do you think were her major accomplishments? Well, certainly uh, tax reduction which and job creation. That's right, yeah. uh, really, the, she was focused on the employment rate. Um, I think she was very, you know, because of where she grew up and living on the farm, the environment was very important to her. So it was preservation of, spa of, of uh, open space, a lot of coastal issues. Um, she was important. She was smart growth. She was very involved in those all those issues. Took a, some heat for them, uh, but cared about those issues because she really felt New Jersey was a better state if we weren't so congested. Um, so the, I think those are some of her. She was interested in tourism and in the arts. Um, uh, so I think those were the her major accomplishments. She cared very much about the the budget. Uh, you know, she had a surplus when she had, when she left government. Um, she cared about policy very much, you know, she cared about the details too. Talk a little bit, if you would, about the job creation and the approach that you took in your role. Um, what steps did you take in the, to contribute to that success? Well, I think, one, you know, she, she worked with a lot of people in the private sector to let, it, let them know that she, they were welcome. You know, sometimes CEOs don't feel welcome in certain states. Uh, Larry Cody from PSNG was a, a good partner. And uh, he worked with her a lot. You know, I think from him I learned, from watching him, uh, I really learned for the first time what a good, uh, not good, a, a great corporate citizen is like. And this is somebody who was a CEO of PSNG, yeah. where I spent the day yesterday. Uh, and, um, you know, it's funny how cir you know, circles of life. When my grandfather came here from Ireland, his job, PSNG was really a place where a lot of immigrants got their first job. Uh, and he was a line. He was a lineman uh, in Jer Jersey City. That's uh, and so 
you know, so I was there yesterday uh, talking to some people, and I, I mentioned that, and they were saying that they hear that a lot. But Larry, who has uh, worked with the Whitman administration a lot, you know, did a lot of private uh, public sector uh, initiatives, and uh, I, I learned from him sort of what, how, when you are in those positions, uh, you give back to government as much as you can or work with them as much as you can. So, but to answer your question more directly, I think was, you know, she had a, a commerce secretary, um, Gil Medina, who was very active with the private sector. And I think st uh, things like tax credits, I think they, uh, a lot of CEOs care a great, great deal about transportation. So I think she focused on that, getting people to and from work. They cared about the harbor, you know, getting goods in and out of the state. So I think she was very in tune to what they cared about, and that was the transportation of their own people, transportation of goods, uh, good economic climate, uh, and then school systems. A lot of CEOs decide relocation factors really based on um, the quality of schools. So she's, she was in tune to how CEOs thought and what was important to them and tried to address them. But she actually kept, uh, you know, she was very... I didn't keep this list, but she would keep a list of, she was very involved in the number of jobs created on a quarterly basis, and that was one of the metrics she assessed herself by. Wow. What would you say were some of her weaknesses? You know, probably uh, uh, the retail politics, I think. She uh, really didn't uh, love. <laughs> uh, and I think probably to be uh, most effective, you have to, you have to get into the game. Um, and the fact that she wasn't a legislator, so she didn't have that. And truthfully, you know, she, she worked a long day, but her, she really told the scheduling office uh, on Friday night she wanted to be home. Uh, she got a lot of joy, she, she would tell me, she just wanted to open up a box of spaghetti that night. You know, after being governor and on all week, I think she just wanted to be home. And uh, uh, she would go to evening events, but she wanted to be home at a decent hour and uh, see her husband before it. So that, she, I think she paid a price for that. Uh, she, the, the politics matters, and um, so I think that was probably not her strength. The time, the time that she would go home on Friday, in what way do you think she paid for that? In what way do you think that affected? I think Pete, when you're governor of New Jersey, such a big job, people want a piece of you. Um, and uh, I think she's, you know, she, She's a private person, um, and she's not al doesn't always want to be a public persona. She's not a Bill Clinton, or you know, she's not always on. Uh, and she likes to read and think and spend time with her family. And it is, she's not a politician's politician that way. Um, what would you say were her failures? Were there failures? I know I just asked you weaknesses, but mm -hmm. anything specific like? because she didn't work with the legislature in the way that a, a real political animal would, did you, certain policies go by the wayside that you think she, she was disappointed about? I, I saw that more on the federal level, I, would get, I, I think, but the White House really drove the legislative agenda more than EPA did. Um, I think she wanted to, you know, get more done on the federal level, but, you know, it takes 10 years for something to get done at the federal level. It's not the same time frame as the state level. Um, on the state level, you know, I think she got done a lot what she wanted to do in, in terms of job creation and uh, improving the economy, and then some of the uh, smaller but important issues that were important to her, um, uh, like drug courts and yeah. disabled and those issues she did really care about. Yeah. Um, looking at her administration as mm -hmm. a whole, Assess it for us. <laughs> you know, I, I know people in prior different administrations, and certainly worked in who worked both in the state and federal level, uh, because they are intense atmospheres. I think sometimes there isn't um, people don't get along, and there's a lot of uh, 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 intrigue or fighting or what. However, uh, I, I say with all honesty, the the group I worked with. Uh, Mike Torpy and John Farmer, um, and the deputies I worked with, Bruce Dowd and Brian Baxter. I think we all came to work every day, um, supporting each other and having each other's back. So I think, um, again, this I think comes from her uh, value system of treating people respectfully and civilly, uh, that there was uh, that trickle down to all of us. That sounds like yeah. a successful organization. Yeah, I, in a I, lot I of think ways. so. And I think a lot of us who moved on to other jobs 
uh, carry that with us. In terms of the um, administration's contribution to the state, mm -hmm. what do you think? Well, certainly history will will show that she was the first woman governor uh, and handled that huge responsibility uh, ably and well and with civility. Um, and I think you know people may disagree with some of the things that she did or didn't do, but I, I don't. I think people uh, will understand, acknowledge she did the best she could for the citizens of the state. Like she was that was never in doubt that she was in it for anything else than to serve the citizens of the of the state. And I think you know I was at Drum Flacker with her one time, and uh, I was listening to the radio on the way to meeting her, and I was talking about this radio show how uh, the interviewer was interviewing college students who went to school in New Mexico and all different parts of the country and they were saying why they missed their state and uh, you know, a student from New Mexico said she'll miss the sunsets and, and so I was saying you know something I guess people wouldn't say that in New Jersey that they'd miss the sunsets necessarily and she went on this long passionate uh, response about how wonderful the state is and the number of languages that were spoken here and that you can go there's mountains and there's the coastline, and you know, she so she really did that. And, and after listening to her, I said, she really, you know, you really got a sense that she really loved the state, and she still does. I mean, she's still here, uh, and you know, I bring my dogs. She is um, at the time she had four or five Scottish Terriers. I don't know if you know. Oh, that's I right, because you know, so anyway, <laughs> I actually have one, one now because of her. Exactly. <laughs> so I have two now because of her. She gave me one, and then I bought the other one, and so and, as I said, she influenced us in all sorts of ways. Um, <laughs> But uh, so sometimes I bring the dogs and we just walk around and uh, you know I, I, she's as I said she's just very content and um, looks back on that time with I think a lot of pride. Mm. Did you experience yourself as being part of historic change or achievement? Yeah, I think you know both Jane and I did, and uh, certainly Hazel and Judy and all the women who were there during the first administration um, were felt they were part of history, making history. And and uh, wanted to live up to that responsibility. Mm -hmm. After Governor Whitman left office, went mm -hmm. to the EPA. What happened to the changes in policy and personnel that occurred that she that she saw through? You know, we left in on a Friday, and and Monday we're in Washington D.C. Uh, and so it was such a whirlwind when we got to EPA that it. I tried to keep up, but you know, it was just such a different world. I, I really didn't keep up for a year or two while I was at EPA. I was like, I can't really answer that question that well. You went with her. I did. I was a chief of staff at EPA. So tell us about that when she asked you that question. <laughs> what, what was that like? I think like? she wanted several of us to go with her uh, because she was comfortable with us. And uh, uh, you know, she asked me if I wanted to go. And some people in the Washington office. and. Uh, uh, I jumped at the chance, so I was very grateful to be able to go, uh, to go with her, and so we had hearings the month prior to her, um, and um, uh, so I, it was, you know, uh, EPA administrator is a tough job, and uh, so a lot of people felt either EPA was ignoring the science or. Uh, uh, so everyone, no matter what, I'm saying, her, their advice to her was. You know, re respect the science. Respect the science. So it was, uh, it was a, it was a very uh, a frenetic time. You know, because you're just sort of jumping in right away. And then, uh, what happened was, I think this happens in every change of administration. Uh, the chief of staff at the White House stops all the regulations that are in the pipeline, because they right, justifiably right. want to take another look at them. So EPA, I think, had about a hundred regulations that were stopped. So uh, she had to sort of look at those again, and it was this constant drip drip, drip, because I think the country was still reeling from the close election. Uh, so whatever she, whatever any um, cabinet member did was looked upon very closely. And one of the first things that she had to look at was the amount of arsenic allowed in water supply. And uh, what she was hearing from the Western governors was that it was going to be very, it was an economic issue, very costly to um, address this issue. So she said, she decided to, that to put it on hold and you sort of everything went kaboom. Uh, so every, everything that she was doing was very, very controversial, and it was, it was difficult for all of us to sort of help her navigate all those minefields, because she was getting um, a lot of, most criticism from her own party uh, in Washington. So it was, 
you know, it was a, but again, you know, she never blamed anybody. You know, she was just sort of moving ahead, trying to do the best job she could. Um, but, um, you know, that was difficult that first year, moving through all those regulations. Um, and it was, it was a lot of them. And the ground zero issue, how, how was that for you? So I was there that? at that time. And um, uh, so, and, and I've seen this in, in several novels and references to mm -hmm. it, because it was this, and you would call it, it was just a, the sky was so blue that day. Yeah. So the, the government shut down, and so all of us um, walked from, you know, miles, because the metro was uh, out and everything. Um, she was had moved with the cabinet to a safe place and um, so then it happened you know it was very quickly after that and of course we listened to the scientists uh, and you know told us what she told announced that it w was safe um, so it was a very difficult time because again she was um, under the uh, you know it, let me see. There's a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, we didn't know we didn't know at the time, uh, but we listened to what the scientists. You know, EPA. Seventy percent of the agencies are either scientists or engineers. It's a very professional agency. Um, so, you know, we did we did the best we could, uh, but it was a hard time for her. her. As you know, her son was on Wall Street at the time. So. Oh gosh. Yeah. Well, um, you've had a very interesting career since mm -hmm. then. I have. Tell, tell um, us about it. So I left uh, EPA after several years and then uh, formed a consulting group with Governor Whitman, Jane Kenney, Jessica Fury, and Susan Spencer Mulvaney, five of us who had worked, again, five women, uh, who worked uh, at EPA together. And uh, we did a lot of consulting on, and she just wanted to focus on policy. Uh, so we did a lot of consulting on energy and open space issues and smart planning. And then one of the clients that we, I, we were a consultant to was a woman who owned a company called CMC Energy Services, and I was the main point on that. And she asked me if I, we were walking up in Newark one day, actually, mm -hmm. and she asked me if I'd be willing to, she, wanted, she was 84 at the time, and she uh, said she couldn't do it anymore. Did I want to assume uh, the position? And I, again, you know, again, it, I was, yeah, I held you know, it. Was, I, get, I think if I knew then what I know, knew now, I, I might have waited at least a day. Um, <laughs> but I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And uh, and that called the governor right away. And I was nervous about calling her because we had, we had been together for so long. Um, and she said, oh, no, you have to take this opportunity. Again, very gracious and not thinking of herself. And um, and so I left, and I've been there been there since. So it, it's been a, been great. That's great. Um, is there anything that we haven't asked you about the Whitman administration that you'd like to put on the record with us? No, I guess, uh, you know, for st students, graduate students wanting to go into a career like mine, which I, you know, since I, I, since I left government, I've, I've taught uh, policymaking at several institutions, including this one. Um, and wh what I, so I, I taught at Columbia and, and College in Jersey and Rutgers, and I, I enjoyed teaching at Rutgers the most because I think Rutgers does a fantastic job of educating children who are the first in their families to go to college. I, I forgot about that, you know, and so the course that I taught was I think four to seven, and a lot of kids around 10 to seven would start getting their things together because they were going to jobs. Um, and they were jobs like stocking shelves in drugstores and lots of different things, and sometimes I'd have to go into Brunswick, I'd drop some of them off. So, you know, the, I would describe them as sort of scrappy, um, which I, I think is a good attribute in a student, you know, so I, I really, so anyway, so I, I would uh, talk to them about what it was like in the federal government versus the state government, and um, as I said, state government, if you're lucky enough to be where I was at the time, you can move the ball forward, not every day, but most days, and do something good. On uh, the federal level, while you're uh, making policy for the entire country, uh, which is one of the things I learned in when I was at EPA, that in some parts of the country, jobs are so much more important than any environmental issue. They don't really care about the environment. They care, not you know, as, right. as we do in the Northeast, because we have the luxury right. of caring. Um, but uh, they don't. So that that was a great learning experience for me to realize how geography trumps policy in lots of different ways. Um, but uh, state government is really where the, there's a lot of action if you have an, a governor interested in doing a lot of things and you can have a, a lot of fun. And uh, uh, you're working with people who are committed and that's, has, I can't really undervalue that, uh, overvalue that. I, 
uh, lots of former chiefs used to come in and see me when I was in the governor's office who worked under different administrations and they would sometimes say, oh, this was the best job I ever had. And at the time, I was thinking, oh, God, that's sad. I hope that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> um, but I, now I understand it more. It wasn't as it, because it is this very special time, and you just have to value that for what it is. It's not like sad or it just is what it is. Uh, it's a special time in your life uh, working for a special person. Um, and uh, you value for what it for what it is because I'd have to say I agree after 20 years of speaking to those people saying I hope I never say that I'd have to say that myself it was uh, you know a very special time and I I uh, appreciate it very 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 much.